In a Premier League season like no other, one side looking to capitalise on the madness is Aston Villa. Ever since destroying Liverpool 7-2 on the 4th of October, the Midlands outfit has refused to be quiet, and with the halfway point approaching, are well in the hunt for European football. Only Covid has managed to halt their rise into the top six. It's a remarkable feat not only because they finished 17th last season, but considering the wild sequence of events at the club over the past few years. Broken promises, heartbreak and a financial nightmare left Aston Villa's very existence in jeopardy, and it's taken a monumental effort to reverse the decline. But how did one of English football's founding fathers manage to return from the brink? Let's find out. The Collapse Turn the clock back to Friday the 25th of May 2018, and Aston Villa's future hangs in the balance. It was the day before their championship playoff final against Fulham at Wembley, the most expensive game in world football. However, the club had just been warned by HMRC that they could be wound up unless a £4.2 million tax bill was paid imminently. This made promotion back to the promised land of the Premier League and the potential £160 million upturn in finances that came with it, not just a rich reward but a matter of survival. But to understand how the seven times FA Cup winners arrived at such a dangerous predicament, you have to go back to June 2016. Aston Villa had just been relegated from the top flight for the first time in their history, and their unpopular American owner Randy Lerner was facing massive pressure to leave. Then out of nowhere arrived Dr Tony Xia, an optimistic Chinese businessman looking to expand the trend of Asian investment in European football. Following his £76 million takeover, Xia laid out his ambition to replicate the ownership model of the City Football Group. Feeder clubs were eyed across Europe, Champions League football pinpointed, and even a Hollywood film about Villa suggested. Money wasn't supposed to be an issue. The lucrative parachute payments from the Premier League offered a prosperous lifeline, while Xia pointed to the £430 million sale of his company T Max as proof of cash. After years of frustration and mistrust under Lerner, Villain fans could believe again. And initially, Xia didn't disappoint. In 2016 17, the club splashed a massive £77 million in transfer fees on 16 new players in a bid to seal promotion at the first time of asking. But for all the investment, the results failed to follow and it wasn't long before cracks began to appear under the Chinese businessman. Roberto Di Matteo was dismissed and Steve Bruce brought in as manager, though even the experienced veteran couldn't rescue the Birmingham outfit season. To make matters worse, the majority of their signings failed to deliver. Scottish forward Ross McCormack encapsulated these struggles, signing from Fulham for just under £13 million before departing six months later on loan to Nottingham Forest under acrimonious circumstances. He scored just three times in 20 appearances. Unbeknown to most Villa fans, Xia was facing financial difficulty back in his homeland. As a result, Chinese-owned clubs across Europe, including Inter Milan, Atletico Madrid and Slavia Prague, all experienced reduced cash flow following pressure from their government. Aston Villa were no different, and with the majority of Xia's assets tied up in Chinese businesses, moving it out of the country became challenging. During the 2017-18 season, it reportedly cost £5 million a month to keep Villa afloat, and despite reassurances money was available, spending plummeted. Only Glenn Whelan and Ahmed Al Hamadi were signed for a total of £2.52 million, while Villa even began falling behind on previous transfer payments. As his cash flow problems worsened, a defiant Shia explores selling land around Villa Park off for development, and began to borrow money against the future sales of Jordan Veratout and Jordan Amavi. But it wasn't enough. With the net closing in, it became clear promotion provided the only escape from their financial black hole. The disaster was confirmed when Tom Kearney struck to seal victory for the Cottagers, and confined Villa to a third straight season in the Championship. The solemn sight of their owner in the stand said it all, dark days were ahead. The Revival Defeat to Fulham left the club in panic mode. As a new agreement with HMRC was desperately thrashed out, the backroom at Villa fell apart. The club CEO, Keith Wynas, was suspended following a fallout with Xia, while the director of football, Steve Round, would quit. With the club facing a £40 million deficit, it was clear that unless Xia reluctantly accepted outside investment, prize assets like Jack Grealish would have to be sold. To many, this was an unthinkable scenario. Two saviours arrived in the form of Nassif Swariris and Wes Edens. Ranked as the fourth richest African in the world by Forbes in 2019, Swariris boasted a $7.5 billion fortune back in Egypt. Wes Edens, meanwhile, was an American billionaire and co-owner of NBA side Milwaukee Bucks. For an initial £50 million, they took control from Dr. Jean and immediately settled their financial woes. But it was the capture of Dean Smith two months into the 2018-19 season that proved to be the real turning point. Born and bred in the West Midlands, Smith's passionate understanding of the area and pedigree as a manager proved vital as he catapulted his new side from mid-table obscurity to the playoffs. Alongside former Liverpool managing director Christian Perslow, Smith created history with a 10-game winning run that culminated in victory over Derby County at Wembley. But their redemption had only just begun. With promotion secure, Villa faced a new problem. 
19 departures thanks to the expiration of player contracts, loans and transfers away from the club, left them with a threadbare squad. So whereas in Eden were left with little choice but to flex their muscles, spending over £130 million on 12 new additions. As Fulham had discovered just 12 months before, getting a virtually brand new side to gel in the Premier League is a daunting task. Villa survived thanks to a final day draw at West Ham, having spent the majority of the season on the cusp of relegation. For all the efforts of their talisman Grealish, only Norwich City had conceded more than their 67 times. And Dean Smith had to endure endless rumours linking Burnley's Sean Dyche and former Benfica manager Bruno Lage with his job. However, their upturn in fortune started during the enforced suspension of the league during the global pandemic. For the first time since arriving at Villa Park, Smith finally was given an extended period to work out methods to improve the defence. Along with his tactical analysis, he encouraged the players to devise their own plans and ideas in the off-season, with overriding emphasis placed on taking fewer risks in difficult situations. Quieter members of the squad were also encouraged to take on more leadership, and the renewed sense of direction and responsibility offered immediate results. Once survival was confirmed, the club could finally press ahead with their plan to cement their place in the Premier League. New Beginnings the first major shift occurred behind the scenes, with a decision made to part ways with sporting director Jesus Garcia Patage and a replacement with Johan Langer. Garcia's relationship with CEO Perslow had turned sour and change was needed. Langer arrived from FC Copenhagen where his data-driven approach to recruitment had been hugely successful. He was immediately tasked with amending the mistakes of the previous summer window, with greater emphasis placed on quality over quantity. Smith, Perslow and new director of recruitment Rob McKenzie made excellent strides in the market signing five players at a value of £75 million. Eight clean sheets and a 77% save rate puts Emiliano Martinez among the very best keepers in the division, while Matty Cash, Bertrand Traore and £28 million forward Ollie Watkins have all risen to the challenge. Even England international Ross Barkley signed on loan from Chelsea after an extensive charm offensive from Smith and Jack Grealish. The fact Grealish was even around to sway Barkley over was a victory in itself, with his new five-year deal at Villa Park seen as the pinnacle of their business. However, signings from their infamous summer window of 2019 now deserve a huge amount of credit. Five of them started in the 7-2 demolition of Liverpool, including the tireless Trezeguet, Matt Target and Esri Concer. Brazilian star Douglas Luiz has blossomed after a year of Smith's coaching, while Anwar Algarzi has silenced his critics after a stunning December that delivered five goals. In the backroom star Craig Shakespeare arrived to complete the new team. The former Leicester City and Everton assistant has proved to be the perfect complement to John Terry's influence in the dressing room. In short, a mixture of targeted signings, coaching and excellent personnel behind the scenes has helped transform Villa from a side scraping for safety to one on the cusp of European football. Make no mistake, the historic stands at Villa Park are ready to roar again once fans are allowed to return. It's been over four years since Dr Tony Jean predicted a prosperous future for Aston Villa. Hardship may have followed and new owners required, but the sun is firmly shining on the Midlands project. With finances stabilised and the management team all on the same page, the squad has finally been able to grow back into their old Premier League shell. And at the heart of the project is a strong feeling of togetherness. Dean Smith reportedly tells each player to be a good teammate before every game, to fight for each other until the end. And after all the challenges and dangers the club has endured, it is the perfect mantra for the new look Aston Villa. So guys, that was our FD Explained on Aston Villa and their return to the Premier League and establishment back amongst the big boys. What did you guys think of it? Let me know in the comments down below. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it, leave a comment and click on screen for another great FD video. And I'll see you next time.